So welcome to my talk on uh, encryption. Um, as we're already running a little bit late, I'll just uh, jump quickly like a, yeah, I'm running meetings plus plus and I'm doing the talk here. So um, I would like to start this talk with a short disclaimer. I'm not an expert in description and this talk is meant to be an overview. Um, and so I'm gonna try to cover crypto PEP, Botan and Lipsodium in this talk to give you an overview of how to use encryption in your application. That's the whole goal of the talk. <clears throat> and yeah, what did motivate me to do this talk? I was looking for a solution last fall and was seeing that basically um, it was very hard to find really good material on it. There's a lot of libraries, uh, there's some libraries on encryption um, which are having their own documentations, but um, using AES or um, other encryption algorithm turns out to be more difficult than it should be. And um, so I was working through uh, getting myself into this uh, field and then I thought why not do a talk on it and uh, have other people uh, to also have uh, things like an encryption easier to understand. And um, also what I found out last uh, fall and um, also have been by some people uh, told this um, that basically there has never been any overview on encryption on any conference, so um, I uh, tried to change this with this talk. So um, again, I want to stress uh, that this is an overview and so we're talking about using encryption and not about implementing it, so um, that's a whole diff different topic and I think that most uh, the the most people which are good at implementing are not the good people which are good at C++, so there is a very small share between people which actually uh, invent and uh, make encryption algorithms and people which are writing libraries. So um, most of the libraries which I will show you, or actually all the libraries I saw are very close to C, um, and uh, the code itself is uh, mature. So um, some of the libraries are now moving to C++11 in the next version, but in the current version, um, they're mostly based on C++03. And um, also there's an ongoing discussion in the last half year um, about encryption and the governments want you to put backdoors in your application or you know, to weaken encryption algorithms. And so yeah, that's, that's an ongoing discussion. And it could be that you know some parts of this talk are in a few years maybe not really, um, not uh, so legal as they are today. Um, there's already the legal situation in the US that the FBI wants to, to have your keys and they also have the legal situation that they have the ability to get those. Um, <clears throat> but the problem with backdoors is uh, currently um, visible in the whole TSA keys um, affair that the, the TSA keys leaked and basically all our luggage is now opening by, is now being, being open to everybody as those keys are now basically printable by everybody who has a 3D printer. And the TSA is like reacting like, we don't care, that's not really an, uh, affecting us and it's not gonna uh, have an effect on airport security, we will see that later. And on that point, I also want to uh, point out that if you, have, if you are working on a startup and you, know, you want to be trusted by the security community, you might sort of think about having a canary on your website which you know, is updated once a week. And once uh, your security model is broken, you, keep, uh, you stop updating the canary. But that's actually, again, a different topic. Um, as a field of security and encryption is very broad, I want to point out that um, you, as a, as a developer, are a target for governments, services, uh, botnets, etc. Also, because over you know we, we're writing the software, and software eats the world. So we are as software developer, uh, software developers are becoming an increasing important target by um, not only services but also by uh, criminal um, organizations. So um, interesting data, which are on our machines and all, which is also shared like in the Internet of Things. Uh, I like things like passwords, email, logins, and also the hardware resources. Once a machine is hacked, you can mine crypto coins on it, or you can use it. Uh, if it's not strong enough to uh, mine crypto resources, um, then it's still good for doing a uh, DOS attack. So there has been a very good talk on that topic on the Qt DevTest, which I linked in the slides. But um, 
before I get into the actual C++ encryption, I want to also point out that the attacker which will, you know, try to crack your encryption or try to crack your software lives in the future, but you write your code today, and um, even if we like have today better tools like sanitizers and intelligent fuzzers, um, you always should uh, have um, when, when you're writing security critical code in your mind that your attacker probably has much more resources than you do, and if the attacker lives in the future in a few years, they automatically gain more resources as our technology advances and our technology advances even faster than. Um, that it did in the past, so um, worse laws, etc. You know, the, 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 the raw power we have in, in machines will double each like two years for the current uh, time, probably still like for 10 years. <clears throat> Which brings me to a very short update on uh, encryption topics, um, which will play a key role in this talk. Um, there's a symmetric encryption where you have one key uh, which is used for encryption and decryption. And that is then, uh, for example, a uh, symmetric encryption standard is a very well-known algorithm for that. Um, then there's the asymmetric um, method to encrypt things where you have two keys, a public key and a private key, and you shouldn't share your private key, and the public key is basically available for everyone. And if somebody wants to send you a message, they can encrypt it with a public key, and with a private key, it's only uh, decryptable. So, for example, RSA is a very well-known algorithm in that field. Um, the algorithms themselves are mostly in two big classes. There is a block cipher, which always runs on a block of memory, like 512 bytes. And then there's a stream cipher, which in advance generates a key stream and operates on this key stream. And both, both categories have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, a stream cipher can be computed in, in advance, a block cipher usually not. And um, with a stream cipher, you have the problem that if the, the method to generate your key is weak, you're attackable through that. Um, and also, I want to I I wanna stress that HDPS is not really encryption. Um, HDPS is only transport encryption. It doesn't work, for example, for UDP. Um, and the data inside this encrypted pipe is still not encrypted. So um, I have seen a few projects that managers thought if they apply HTTPS, it automatically everything is secure and they have encryption in their project. That is not the case. <clears throat> Which brings me shortly to a uh, connected uh, field like passwords and how to store passwords. Um, when, when you have authentication, of course, you shouldn't store it as plain text. That's a bad example. And you should uh, hash it correctly, which is a whole different topic, so I'm not going to really go in depth with that. But one problem I want to also point out is that you have logins like to your databases and to other tools, um, which you actually need to store in some form that you can decrypt and then have the password as a plain text to actually be able to log on to your database or something. And so there, there's a key question for me still, how to store that in a correct manner. Um, if you, you know, encrypt your key in a symmetric way, you have another key which you, you need to store somewhere in a secure way. Um, the same thing applies to the private key if you do it asymmetrically. Um, and private keys are often, when they're saved on, on the drive, they're often encrypted with a password. So you again have a password. Um, and yeah, plain text is, is an option if you consider your machine uh, secure. Um, you can choose to, to mutate this uh, plain text to your real password, which makes it a bit more secure. Um, a few um, operating systems offer APIs, and I know, for example, that Putty has a daemon which allows you to store keys. Um, so maybe on your platform exists something like that, so you should look that up. And I'm still thinking on that from looking forward if uh, this feedback on the topic, I'm really interested in that. Um, which brings me to the, to the main topic of this talk, like how to do encryption in C++. And the first, the first news I have for you is like uh, unsigned char. That's, that's, that's a great, the great uh, and only, uh, language basically encryption speaks. Uh, every algorithm I have seen so far mostly um, operates on unsigned char, 
and we do have those interfaces of uh, passing in a pointer to an array and length, and this is C-like interfaces like everywhere. Um, but most interfaces which uh, which we have in our own code, like std string, are either signed char or something else. So that interface actually makes sense to uh, to use as the um, as we usually cast the data, which we want to encrypt to unsigned char, and then have some part in the memory which was allocated before as actually being something else, being encrypted or decrypted. Um, and a short word on the standard. The standard has a random header, which some people think it's safe to use for encryption, and um, that's actually not the case. Um, you can't really trust random device, which is the actual only thing which is on some platforms secure, as with slip C++ and SCD C++ um, and Linux. And the problem here is, for example, if you use MingW, random device will give you always the same numbers on the, on the windows. So even, even GCC doesn't get that correct, and so you, if, if you need random numbers, like for keys or initialization vectors, like we will see soon, um, use the facilities of the library which you're using and not the standard or some other random source. And the, the same basically applies for boost random. And there are a few encryption libraries out there, and these are just a selection. Um, CryptoVP, Botan, and Libsodium are the three uh, libraries which I have picked to, um, to cover. Uh, everybody who has done any work with the open SSL crypto um, will, you know, when, when you worked with it once, you probably want to avoid it afterwards. So I have, I have implemented an RSA uh, class with uh, open SSL crypto uh, past a while ago, but um, I did not consider that fun and I don't think that it's a secure uh, way to implement crypto for um, a modern world. And then there is a Qt uh, architecture. Um, so if you use Qt, there's an alternative. Um, they are also now running on Qt 4 and Qt 5. But um, yeah, it's, I think if you, if you really need encryption, you should use one of the libraries above. Um, so quick overview on those. Uh, CryptoPP, um, in its current version, uses C++ 03. They're currently working on the next version, 5.6.3, which will be based on C++11. Um, and license-wise, CryptoPP has a boost license, so it's very nice, usable. And also, Botan has a BSD2 license, which is quite easy. Um, also, the next version of Botan um, will feature C++11, and they're already saying if you, if you start to write new code and a new project using Botan, you should not use the stable on C++03 track but you should uh, use the dev um, environment which they're offering also. So, which brings me to Libsodium, which is actually a fork of a different library, the libnacl or libsalt. Um, the only thing which is really worth mentioning is that um, the li this library has been built with, uh, with the goal to make encryption easy. And Unfortunately, they picked an open source license, which is not as easy. Um, the ISC license is, when you look it up, a, a normal open source license, it should be not a problem. But in some organizations, you might run into trouble because the license is not known. So um, if you want to use uh, Libsodium, which is a very nice library, and I really think that um, if you just need encryption and don't need the algorithms behind it, uh, Libsodium is a very good alternative. You should maybe, maybe be prepared to, you know, uh, explain what the ISD license is um, in your organization if you have some strict rules applying to you there. Um, and now I, I like to cover shortly the three libraries with an, an example. So I've chosen for AES, CryptoPP, for, AES, for RSA, uh, Botan, and uh, CryptoBox is basically the approach which Libsodium implements. And the advanced encryption standard is a block cipher. It's a metric, as I already have mentioned. It's widely used in the industry. Um, it operates on different modes, and it needs to be initialized with some random data. 
Um, this is a short overview of the modes. Um, there are five older modes and a few other modes which exist, but there are actually two older, uh, newer modes which are ARX and GCM, which you should use if you can choose your mode. And when we write code, we not always can choose the mode because we get just to encrypt or decrypt something from a different client and then have to use the mode which the client uses. As those modes are not compatible uh, to each other. So if you, if you encrypt in one mode, you also have to decrypt in the same mode. Um, yeah, ECB is an uh, electronic code book. It's not really used for encryption and you shouldn't really use it. As you see, the picture is actually encrypted. Um, and in a, a well-encrypted uh, data set, you shouldn't see any patterns, and you, you, I think you, cle you clearly can see uh, the image still. So ECB is the, actually the only mode you really should avoid. Um, then there's uh, cipher block chaining, and like the most modes, uh, it's secure when used properly, and like most modes which we're gonna see, it allows parallel decryption. Um, and yeah, disadvantages is no parallel encryption and there are known attacks like malleability. And um, so malleability means that if I know the position of the bytes in your encrypted data, I can flip a bit in there and change your data. And um, if I do it correctly, you're not able to notice it because all of those modes don't implement authentication. So you're basically not knowing what, there's no hash basically authenticating the data which you have been sent over the wire or which has been saved on some drive. Then there's the OFB mode, uh, which is a stream cipher mode for AES. Uh, it has the advantage that the key stream can be, as I told you earlier, advanced, and uh, it can be computed in advanced, and um, there are fast hardware implementations for it available. Um, some people think that the security model of it is questionable, and um, if you have a misconfiguration, then you might have to, the, the short, the, the key cycles might be too short that actually the encryption of you is not as strong as you wanted. Then cipher feedback is basically the CBC backwards. Uh, it's not very common, it's just, for example, uh, the, the example which is in the wiki. Uh, which I also picked for this talk, so it's, it's, it's probably used out there. Um, small uh, footprint it has, and uh, it allows parallel decryption. Counter mode is what the newer modes are based on because it allows parallel end and decryption and therefore has the best performance uh, values for encryption, and I couldn't find any negative points on that. Um, And yeah, as I mentioned, there are two newer modes, and those new, newer modes both add uh, authentication to your encryption, and they're basically based on the counter mode, which we saw earlier. Um, and yeah, which one to choose? It depends really on what, what your application is and on what hardware environment you're running and what the, the uh, goals of your encryption are. Um, if you can use AIX or GCM, um, you should definitely use those modes as they add uh, certain layer of security above the encryption uh, with authentication. And yeah, counter mode is good and the other modes are also used in, in the wild. So sometimes you just have to use what your server sends you in encryption. So um, one more important thing to mention is that AES needs to have an initialization vector which is uh, 16 bytes long. It must be random, it should not be pseudo-random. Uh, it can be public, it's a bit like a public key, but it doesn't, it is basically for, initial, for initialization of the algorithm. And uh, yeah, you shouldn't reuse it, so each time you need that, you should recalculate it, and uh, usually libraries provide facility for generating random bytes, which you should apply here. And a short co uh, code example. So IS keys are either 16 or 32 bytes by standard, and um, so, we get the seeded bytes in CryptoPP from a class called auto seeded random pool. And then we simply generate a block of, for the key. And then we generate a block for the initialization vector. Then um, the encryption. We just have some 
text and the example is just taken from the wiki, it's very C-like. Um, and the text is then encrypted into, um, we see that uh, the modes in, in CryptoVP are actually templates and take the algorithm which they should uh, then implement. And then via process data, we do the encryption and the decryption is very similar, just that we um, use now the uh, decryption option in the type def here. So um, AS in CryptoPP, you should use a random initialization vector and the key is not a password. That's also something important to know that um, passwords lack, um, you know, they are, they're not good for encryption. So um, if you want to use a, a password for encrypting something, you have to turn the password into something which is good for encryption, which is random. Um, and yeah, the modes, uh, you should do a little bit of research what, what mode you should use and um, if you can use the, no, the newer modes, you should do that. And um, also, what I didn't mention there is a little issue with padding um, offset before the encryption is that um, AES can have in some implementations the weakness that um, you basically can guess, the, if you have enough data, you can guess the key and there is an, a method against that and that is padding good at actually a random order of bytes is applied to your encrypted data but the crypto PP examples do not uh, use uh, padding, but that's another method which is uh, known to uh, strengthen your encryption. Which brings me to RSA. As I previously mentioned, it's an asymmetric cipher. You have two keys, a public and a private one. Um, the public key is used for encryption and can and should be shared, otherwise it doesn't work and the private key uh, must not be shared, should be protected. Usually it's stored in some encryption manner, which are also standards existing for to be uh, stored in some safe storage like the drive. Um, I do use Botan in this example. Um, Botan needs to be initialized. There is a method called Botan library initializer. Oh no, that's actually a class. Um, and you need to create an instance on the stack and uh, yeah, this instance can throw, so you might want to guard it or maybe also your application just should abort if you cannot create this instance. And yeah, Botan is just like CryptoPP, a collection of encryption algorithms. And of course, one of the questions when, when I was starting with RSA, I was like, where, where do I get such a private key from? And um, Botan has basically a, a class and um, which has the role of being a private key and the constructor uh, takes the random, number gen the, random, the random number generator from Botan and the size of uh, the bits which the key should have. And in the example, um, so as we see in the example, Botan already uses std string, uh, and they also have some auto seeded RNG which just securely generate random numbers and is seeded automatically. Um, then uh, RSA private key is generated with 1024 bits. Um, the question how big an RSA key should be is a bit, um, depends on how much of a performance impact you can take. I think that in the current stage, a key with 4,097 uh, 4, bits should be enough, in my, my opinion. Uh, 2,048 is also okay, in my opinion. But that's, that's again something which you have to decide how long should your encryption be strong. Then the key gets encoded and again and stored in two std string variables. One is the public key and one is the private key and both of those are de derived from the private key which we just have generated. Then those um, 
this data will actually get stored in, in, in a class which will take uh, care of the key memory so that uh, it's cleaned up efficiently and zeroed out at deletion so that uh, people not cannot see your key in memory. Um, then um, to actually have the, the, the setup to encrypt and decrypt is a bit more complicated with RSA and Botan. So you have to load the key, uh, the private key and the public key in corresponding classes. Um, you then dynamic cast those uh, instances to an encryption key and a decryption key, which then are actually um, handed over to a method where we then actually hand over which actual um, implementation we want to use of RSA. And then the NN decrypting is uh, simply having a secure vector byte ciphertext and then calling encrypt or decrypt on the N encryption and decryption uh, objects. So as we see, the setup for RSA and AES can be quite tricky and there's a lot of things which can go wrong and there's a lot of things which often have gone wrong. And the security community has responded with that and said, well, we, we might need a different approach. We need something which is secure. And a lot of people, including me, it's, I'm not looking like for, for a complicated setup. All I want is encryption and I want safe encryption. So they have come up with a method called CryptoBox, um, which basically does all the setup internally and gives you some box where you can encrypt or decrypt with. <coughs> And yeah, in, in pseudo code, you, you have a method encrypt and decrypt and give it a key, a buffer, and an algorithm, and it does it what, 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 what it should. Um, in, in practice, it's not that easy, but almost. So uh, this crypto box approach is covered by Botan and by Lipsodium. Lipsodium basically is based on the idea of offering um, crypto boxes to use to the end user. So Lipsodium offers a symmetric and an asymmetric crypto box, which you also, for the asymmetric uh, crypto box, you also can uh, generate the keys and send the, the public key to, to your counter. And um, so both sides can actually <coughs> use the crypto box with the other side's uh, public key. Um, the Botan implementation is, first, uh, is based on Serpent, and I have chosen the example to be from Lipsodium. Um, so Lipsodium is a fork of Lip NA, or Lipsalt and um, its goal is to make encryption better accessible. Um, it's a C library, C++ wrappers exist, but none of them really satisfy me and other people, so um, you might directly want to use the C library if you use uh, Lipsodium. Um, and you have to call sodium init when you want to use any of its methods. That's like the first method you have to call in each thread is calling uh, sodium init to set up the environment for, the, for lip sodium. And in the code example, which of course is C as a C library, um, we see that uh, they choose to def you define several macros to uh, actually cover their uh, needs so we have a message and a message length and then they need to calculate the actual cipher text length so the, the crypto box has of course an overhead though that they need to calculate the message length plus this overhead is the actual length of the cipher text then um, and then several arrays for the nonce which basically is the kind of like a initialization vector and the key and the cipher text are located on the stack and then um, yeah the nonce and the key are filled with random bytes and then um, the actual call to the crypto box um, happens in crypto box easy with just handing over the corresponding parameters and then the decryption is again very easy you, you need to know the message length in advance 
which probably is the, the only thing which you really need to transfer unencrypted. Um, the crypto box then itself will um, present yourself to, to yourself as a method called or a function called crypto secret box open easy. And in this case, if this function uh, does not return null, that means that the message has been forged, that there's something happened, some it is flipped or something has gone wrong, and you shouldn't trust that message. And um, Libsodium uses for their crypto boxes uh, Xsalta stream cipher in the standard um, version. Uh, you also can specify different ciphers, but that's a different topic. Um, in the asymmetric implementation, they use a certain curve to do the key exchange, and the encryption is the same. It's again a Xsalta 20 stream cipher. And um, this Xalta cipher is specifically designed to resist certain known attacks on encryption and is actually uh, comparable, comparable to AES. And um, the, both crypto boxes, of course, also have an, uh, an algorithm for authentication. And yeah, final thoughts on the topic. Um, you should today in your applications encrypt your critical data. That's, I think, something you really need to do. Um, Botan and Crypto++ both offer a wide set of algorithms um, which are not always easy to set up, but if you need to use those algorithms, um, those libraries are basically your go-to implementation in C++. Um, which one you prefer, it depends a little bit which style you like more. Um, Botan is a bit more object oriented, but both libraries are a bit like, not very modern in the design, and, and some operations are very C-like, and uh, can, in some instances, be difficult to set up. Um, if you just need encryption, and a crypto box would do, you should use a crypto box, in my opinion. Um, Lipsodium has an symmetric and an asymmetric way to, to do that, and, um, Botan also has a crypto box, which is uh, based on a symmetric cipher. Um, so, which brings me to the last part. If there are any questions, yes. Crypto example is the other. I can restart my question. So you gave one example for Botan. One example. Uh, for libcrypto, uh, do they only, for example, on libcrypto, your example is AES, um, but is that the only, does it not, does it not have um, RSA, or do they? They, I, I have to choose a library to present for, ex sure. for an example. So both libraries have basically all modern encryption algorithms. Okay, so I wouldn't so pick... So RSA and AES are both supported by, lip, uh, by, by both libraries, by Botan and by CryptoPP. Lipsodium, in my memory, does not support those. Uh, Lipsodium brings its own set of algorithms which are specifically designed by people which are designers of such algorithms and um, follows largely the crypto box approach. Okay, so... so your recommendation of crypto, bo crypto box is just because it's probably easier. Yes, it's, it, it depends on, on, on what you need. If you just need encryption, then use a crypto box. That's just, it's, it's easier to set up. You will not make errors. And that's, in, in my opinion, the most important thing in encryption that um, setting up um, RSA or AES is, can be quite complicated and quite error prone. So. In my opinion, the crypto box is the way to go. Because otherwise, you will need to write something similar anyways to, to wrap the safe um, creation and destruction of keys. So um, the, use, the end user interfaces of both libraries, uh, Botan and um, Crypto PPI, do not think that they're very user friendly. So you will have to wrap that in your production code anyways. 
Yes. Hi. Um, I have heard of uh, certain keys that are derived from passwords, encryption keys that you can get. So there are algorithms that you can get uh, a yes. key that are derived from a password. Um, other than the obvious security flaws on using passwords where people can choose obvious passwords and all that, have you researched those and given any thought on those methods? I have not really done deep research on storing passwords. Um, it's not storing passwords, it's deriving an encryption key from a password and then using that. Yes, um, I have not covered that in the talk, so I did not research that entirely. I know that algorithms exist there, but I cannot do and I will not do a fundamental, uh, I, I cannot really tell you what algorithm to use there. Um, so. Uh, you presented uh, um, an example uh, with a uh, lipsodium. Uh, you said that uh, this uh, fork, uh, why is it better <laughs> than lip uh, nacl? Um, lip nacl is also very good, and you also could use it. But lip sodium actually has been forked for the reason to be more user friendly, to be easier to be used, to be less error prone. So um, there's nothing wrong with uh, lip salt, and you can use it. And if you use it in your production code, that's fine. Um, basically, um, the work which has been done by Daniel Bernstein, which is the author of both libraries, is just with the goal to make encryption more accessible and make it easier to use. And um, LibSalt could not really uh, follow up on that, so they made a second library which uh, forked LibSalt and built up on top of the work on off LibSalt. Hey, question. Uh, you mentioned we're writing code now, our attackers in the future. Um, so computers keep getting faster. Is there research or is there talk about how long you can expect your encryption to still be safe? So if I encrypt something today in 20 years, is that trivial? Is it two years, is that trivial? Um, yeah, there's research done on that. There's even research done on methods like uh, quantum computers. I mean, nobody really knows do quantum computers already exist, and if they are, if they exist, are they already used to attack our encryptions? Which um, most of our encryption, or a lot of our encryption, is based on non algorithms which are weak against uh, quantum computers. So there's currently a lot of work done in the field to um, explore ways to. Uh, have algorithms which can resist that, and there's other, uh, the, the current encryption is basically you're safe for 10 to 20 years if you use strong enough keys. That's, that's what, what we think from our position today. But um, there's, I mean, the, the, the current leak of the, um, of the dating platform is a good example where they actually thought that they had encrypted their passwords in a safe way, but made an error in the implementation, which then was actually leading to a, to a weakness so that they can actually decrypt those passwords, those password hashes, uh, quite easily now. So um, there's a lot of research being done on cracking encryption, and there is, um, it always depends on who your attacker is. I mean, if, if it's like in five years, it's clear that the hardware has advanced dramatically. Um, but also today, I mean, if, if, if the Chinese or the, the U.S. decide to, to crack your code because it's important enough to do so, uh, they have a calculation power which is like the whole cloud type in part. So uh, we all have seen what, what uh, data center has been built for the NSA in Utah. Um, they intend to use that for purposes, and it's no reason to believe that uh, the Chinese, the Russians, and other services have not similar uh, capabilities. So um, the encryption is, is, is a good method to, to keep your data safe, but of course there will always be an attacker which could probably already crack it today. Hi, I, I have a couple of questions actually. Um, first, uh, you didn't mention elliptic curve. I was wondering if elliptic curve is among the algorithms provided by the three libraries that you 
that you discussed? And second, once you have these keys, have you encountered any solutions for storing them on the device? Um. Yeah, that's that's basically what I talked in, in the password part. That you know, that's the same thing applies to keys, and there there are standard algorithms to uh, store your um, key encrypted on the drive with a password, and then again you you end up with a problem that you have to store that password in some manner if you actually want to um, unencrypt your private key in an automatic manner with not somebody typing in the key. Um, as I mentioned, there is a daemon by Putty, which can uh, serve as a password uh, store and a uh, secure source for that. And there might be different other daemons and different other um, operation systems out there. I'm, I'm very keen to, to know more about that and how, how this is actually solved in a secure manner. In the beginning, you said that uh, HTTPS is not enough usually, so can you tell some more about that? <coughs> well, HTTPS is encrypting your transport, and within that transport, your data is secure, but there's a, a bunch of attacks known against HTTPS, uh, which starts from having somebody in the middle, like a man in the middle attack, where you're not really going to notice that you're being hacked um, so that when, when you send critical data over the network, HTTPS is not enough. You should always encrypt also your data which you're sending over the encrypted link. That's uh, one of the points because I have been in projects where uh, the project managers basically wanted to send critical data over the internet via HTTPS and they thought it was secure. And I, as a software dev or a as, as a contractor would not implement something like that. I also would make sure that the uh, data you're sending over an HTTPS link is encrypted itself. Any more questions? Oh yeah, right, right, right. Um, yeah, there is work done on elliptic curves, and um, actually, the the key exchange here in this algorithm and the in the asymmetric part, as far as I know, the curve is an elliptic curve. Um, but I have not done extensible research on the curves, as there is currently also a lot of dispute which curves are still safe, which, serve, which uh, curves are, might be getting uh, re recalled or should not be used as uh, NSA might have. Um, that's, that's a problem with curves um, that uh, it's hard to prove that the curve is uh, secure and the, the organization which uh, is kind of trying to standardize a certain curve for encryption um, that needs to be a, a very trustful organization. So um, this curve is a curve which is designed by uh, Daniel uh, Bernstein, um, which is a known encryption researcher himself. So that's in the community thought to be a, a trusted curve. And um, yeah, I, when when I did the talk, uh, when I when I designed the talk in spring. Um, I decided not to handle uh, uh, elliptic curves to, uh, as it's just then again um, another topic which is very important but also very complicated to understand. Okay. Thank you.